Join me for a conversation with the game designer of the legendary Traveler RPG. Welcome to DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Level up your RPG campaigns by filling yourself with stories and knowledge. Explore topics from archaeology to film history to writing to literature and much, much more. This is DiceGeeks.com Tabletop RPG Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Matt and I am your host. This is the podcast where we learn how to become better game masters and role players by filling ourselves with stories and knowledge. All right, guys, I have an incredible interview today. Here it is. My guest today is the game designer behind the Traveler role playing game, Mark Miller. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. No problem. It is my pleasure. Um, how did you first get involved with tabletop role playing games? Oh, you, you know, when we were talking before, you you said you were going to ask that question, and and my first response is, well, I invented tabletop role playing <laughs> games. <laughs> I invented one tabletop role playing game. Um, I started as a war game designer, historical simulations from Simulations Publications Incorporated in new york and so by the time i got around to role playing we'd already seen dozens of war games being produced by our company interestingly enough some war game friends of ours showed up and said you know we've discovered this dungeons and dragons thing and it's really great so of course our entire staff six people we couldn't find a copy in the stores it was too new so we went downstairs to the copy shop and made our own copies, you know, <laughs> ordered them, ordered Dungeons and Dragons from the distributor immediately, but we made our copies in the interim. Um, and for three weeks, we were playing Dungeons and Dragons nonstop. <laughs> it was just crazy. Uh-huh. At, at that point, our, our company president, Frank Chadwick, made one of his pronouncements, and he said, you're not allowed to pay, play Dungeons and Dragons while the sun is up. <laughs> And we're talking about professional offices producing games. And so we stopped playing and started working again. It didn't stop them from playing Dungeons and Dragons. We played it after the sun went down. But um, it was a wonderful time then. We we learned how it worked. We made our own views of how it worked. You know, Dungeons and Dragons is, is kind of miniatures oriented um, because that was Gary Gygax's focus. Um, the role-playing games that we started doing were more battle map oriented because that was our focus. But that's how I got into role-playing games is we played and we played all the time. I had the, the pleasure, the, the, the pleasure of, uh, playing with some truly creative people, Warren Wiseman, Frank Chadwick, um, John Harshman. We had a good time. Uh, that's my foundation. Okay, and, and, and I think it's interesting that the term tabletop role playing game is only like three years old at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we yeah. Had to, we had to find a name for the system because everybody, when I say I, I I play role playing games, they say, "Oh, what computer do you use?" Mm-hmm. And no one has any idea that we came before the computer game context came. So. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, the computer games borrowed a lot from uh, the original uh, ones before then, you know, the tabletop games. Um, so no, that is fascinating um, that you came from Wargaming and then right into Dungeons and Dragons. I guess, um, just to follow up on that, uh, what was it about Dungeons and Dragons that just captured your your guys' imagination right there? We we were a multifaceted game design company. Mm-hmm. Um, Frank Chadwick was a miniatures guy, um, as well as a board game guy. My entire roots are in military war gaming. Other people were interested in other things, and role playing just Dungeons and Dragons specifically just carried us off into a whole different direction, and uh, that's what we enjoyed. It was brand new. Um, I mean, anybody who plays role playing knows its value, can see its intrinsic worth, and we did. And I have to say, it changed our lives. It changed how we looked at gaming. So, mm-hmm. no, absolutely, I, I can only imagine. Um, and now, um, 
So you've discovered Dungeons and Dragons. You're obviously working at a game company. Um, I'm sure the focus then becomes let's create some of our own games of this type, right? Yeah, exactly right. And interestingly enough, the one that we did immediately was on guard. Three Musketeers, um, 1600s, 17th century um, carousing is what it was about. You know, uh, Actually, I, uh, we had a conversation with Gary Gygax, and he basically liked the fact that we did on guard because it was not just a copy of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. The interesting thing about on guard is that everybody created a character and one of them would naturally have the highest social standing. And that person was thus the most important person in the game that evening. And everybody else got points by sucking up to him <laughs> and doing him favors and oh, getting him a drink at the bar, and just all, and everybody just fell all over themselves trying to to get this this reflected glow from his importance. And that person who was the most important was the most random. And so, within our own social hierarchy at the game company, we had people who were at the top and people who were uh, warehouse workers or whatever. And it was a real kick to have you know a warehouse worker end up being the the Prince of Wales or the equivalent, and everybody else was sucking up him. And he would really like that. It's a lot of fun. And we all had a good time falsely sucking up to him and, and doing our deals behind his back, but acting always like he was important. But the other thing was that that game did not have a campaign that you played that evening. And when it was over, you threw your characters away. And the next time you played somebody new was the most important person in the game. Mm -hmm. I thought that was fun. Yeah. It was a totally new take on Dungeons and Dragons. That was not how Dungeons and Dragons is played. But uh, that was our first foray into role playing. It didn't set the world on fire. It was fun. We sold a lot of them, but it was not earth shaking. And so our second attempt was me saying, you know, I like science fiction. I'm doing science fiction games here. There isn't a science fiction Dungeons and Dragons. I want to do that. And everybody said, sure, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so, that's how our design assignment process worked. Okay. And so I, I would assume then your effort would become traveler. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, and going into it, you said you like science fiction. I always like to ask like uh, people, what were some of your influences? Like what were you, were you, did you read a lot of science fiction, I assume? And did you maybe watch the original Star Trek and things like that? Um, I certainly watched Star Trek. I, I started out reading science fiction novels when I was 10 you know, and I have to say that most of their content went over my head, but I enjoyed them. They they meant, meant something to me. Mm -hmm. I read them all through high school. I uh, found that, I, you know, teachers would say, you should read sports stories or you should read classics or something. And none of them interested me. I would try them and they didn't catch my attention the way the science fiction did. I really liked the science fiction. Mm -hmm. Um in my first year of college, I was a commuter student. I took the train into Chicago and went to the University of Illinois there. And every night I would take the train home. That's maybe a 40-minute ride. But I found that when I walked from the University of Illinois campus through basically Skid Row to the train station, I found a little bodega that had a carton of cover-stripped astounding science fiction magazines. Mm -hmm. Who knows why they had a carton of basically the entire run from 1946 <laughs> to 1960-something. Wow. But they did. And so I would buy one every, you know, this place had had a, a shot glass with individual cigarettes for sale on the counter. You know, you know the, you get the atmosphere that we're in. <laughs> I would pick up a copy, pay a quarter for it, and I would that was my was my reading material on the way home. So I, I like to say I'm a classically trained science fiction reader. I've read everything in that period. Um 
And again, I don't know that it all got to me. I think some of it went over my head. Uh, I look back now and I can see things about stories that I didn't see then. But I at least read all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I knew the Heinlein, I knew the Asimov, I knew all the um, uh, uh, Mac Reynolds. I, I just read everything. And frankly, when the time came to do science fiction, my thought was, wow, if I could just write rules on how people work and how planets work, then we can do all of that science fiction. Mm -hmm. Which... I thought it didn't work that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, and so when you were you were starting out kind of the design process uh, with Traveler there, um, you were just kind of alluding to what kind of challenges did you run up against uh, trying to make this sci-fi version of Dungeons and Dragons? Well, the, the challenge was, what are these characters going to be? Um, how do we make it work? Um, What's going to be my model? You know, is it Heinlein? Is it Heinlein's juveniles? And, um, is it Doc Smith? I looked at everything. It soon became apparent that I had to create our own milieu because I couldn't be, it, it couldn't be so generic that somebody else had to make it up. Mm -hmm. And so we did. We decided we're going to do um, Army, Navy, Marines, Scouts, merchants, that makes sense. I mean, those reflected the things we're used to from from Heinlein to Andre Norton to uh, Asimov and Foundation to all those things. Certainly to EC Tub and, and the Dumeris series, which I had just read. Um, and so the time came that we had to, to, to do characters. And uh, I did a character generation system. Except, I'm getting ahead of myself. You know, when you start Dungeons and Dragons, you're you're a, a, a strong youth ready to go out and and explore the world and do things and build up your experience. Everybody starts the same; they're just nothing. Mm -hmm. um, it would be no fun playing Star Trek if you were all ensigns <laughs> on the Enterprise. Mm -hmm. There's nothing for you to do. Yeah. Uh, there are people in front of you who are important, who are captains or admirals or astrogators or something. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm literally recounting to you my own design process in my head. Mm -hmm. So I need somebody, I'm going to have to have somebody who's going to be more than an ensign or more than a private in the army. Um, mm -hmm. Those are things that Dungeons and Dragons doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So we did that. We, uh, said, okay, we have these careers, and you're going to enlist for a while. It's interesting that I had just gotten out of the Army. I had expected to be in the Army for a long time. And uh, after I'd served about three years, they said, okay, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> and so I failed my reenlistment throw. You know, that's how that works. Uh -huh. I'm writing it, 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 that particular process seems to be autobiographical. Um, but the other problem was, just as you can't have everybody be a bunch of ensigns on the Enterprise, mm -hmm. you can't have everybody be a bunch of admirals mm -hmm. on the Enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so if everybody had their way, they would just keep rolling and have more skills and uh, improve with physical, uh, physical training and end up... Uh, 40 some years old and admiral with a lot of skills and a lot of power and everything else. Um, <clears throat> it never, uh, the system never got that far because I saw that flaw immediately. So I put in the survival rule. Okay. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah, that was something I wanted to ask you about because still occasionally online, uh, You'll see, uh, you know, I'll see posts that pop up and they, you know, people will say, did, did the original traveler say you could die during character generation? And it's like, well, yes, it did. Um, and so I wanted to definitely ask about that, like how it came about and why you included that. Because to me, I think it's awesome because it's like a mini game you get to play and you get to play. It's like a mini game. But um, so I do want to kind of get, you know, a little bit more expansion on that. And just uh, so, yeah, not everybody can be an admiral, but why else did you put that in there? 
Well, the other point was that we had a game, um, a, a large scale, near Earth, interstellar, economic space conquest game. Um, and some people came from Earth and some people came from Alpha Centauri or someplace else. They had, we had several different groups of people. And as you played it, you were the, the leader of the entire world, whatever you were. Mm -hmm. And people went out and they spent their fleets um, conquering planets and sent out colonization fleets and colony ships, which uh, everything was slower than light. So that we called it wagon train to the stars. You'd send out a build a ship and send it out. And before it got to the star, it was supposed to get to, you'd already built another ship and sent it out. Um, but it was all very impersonal and economic. And so my thought, and it actually predated Dungeons and Dragons, was that you could have you as the, the leader of Earth or of Alpha Centauri or Sirius or whoever you were could have a son, didn't say a daughter at that point, but son, who was a powerful person, either a, an admiral or a general or a, a, a great uh, explorer or something. You could pick what, what that career was. And frankly, they, they mimicked or they foreshadowed the careers in Traveler. Um, and that son gave you a bonus on the die roll. You could assign your general son to the invading fleet. You could assign your, your explorer son to the exploration system. And, and they naturally had some value, some benefit, because they were really good. Mm -hmm. um, but they were also irreplaceable. That if they got attacked and in the battle they got killed, you didn't get a new one, that was it. You know, and then you would have the appropriate grief as the leader or the anger at the other side or whatever that was. It was a, it foreshadowed the role playing of Traveler, both in the careers and the possibility that he could die in the process of doing this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that influenced me then when, when the time came to make this little process work. Um, so I typed up the tables that basically you see in the original Traveler now, um, where you rolled for uh, promotion and uh, commission and promotion and, and re-enlistment but also for survival. And if you failed the survival role, you know, it wasn't terribly obvious that you would die usually, but you were taking a risk. Mm -hmm. um, your character was dead and you had to start over. So you, and frankly, most people certainly survived the first time they rolled for survive. Mm -hmm. Probably you survived the second time. Um, but then they had to start thinking, is this character value, valuable enough to keep? Or should I just, do I care about him enough that I'm going to keep him? Or do I want to keep risking and risking and hoping that he'll live long enough to get a ship? And it, so that's a mini game. Mm -hmm. And the point, my point is that I typed up these tables and I provided them to this, to the rest of the people at the, at the workshop and they generated their characters and they just howled with laughter when their, their character died. <laughs> and and I, it made me think that I had something there, that, that mm -hmm. they didn't scowl at me because I made his character die. Yeah. They howled that they knew they had taken too much of a risk, yeah. pushed it too far, and indeed had failed. And so they're going to have to start over. Yeah. Uh, but but that howl of laughter, and I've done it, I, I've, I've done it at conventions just for years and um when people play they know they're taking the risk they know they're they're gambling with their own life mm -hmm. when they lose they realize it's on them not on me <laughs> <laughs> no and I, I think it's it's i think it's a really great system because you're absolutely right when you when you talk in kind of in terms of science fiction 
of being on a ship or being in charge of like a military unit of some kind, right? We can't necessarily have, you know, there's not five captain Kirks or something like that, right? There is, there's one captain, there's one admiral, there's the, uh, you know, something like that. So I think it is a good system to, you know, so the one person who pushes their luck and goes on and becomes the captain or whatever, well, um, and everybody else, you know, who makes it to like lieutenant and decides they're not going to risk it anymore and kind of pulls out. Well, um, that kind of sets that up instead of, um, instead of before the session or something, say, okay, well, you make the captain and I'll make the the commander and you make the lieutenant. I think that's, it's a much better system uh, than just kind of assigning those roles. Yeah, you're right. And you can see it harks back to that concept in On Guard that the guy who's the most important isn't necessarily the most important in the social group. And so he enjoys being in charge. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's one of the essences of role playing is that it's 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 not a zero sum game. Everybody gets everyone succeeds when everyone cooperates. And even if you don't think much of that guy who gets to be the captain tonight, we all benefit if we help him. We, you should try this. They we we say to advise him, mm-hmm. and if he's smart, he takes our advice rather than insisting on doing some stupid thing. <laughs> but um, uh, and so that scattering of ranks enhances everybody working together and trying to, to have the group succeed. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it. I think it's a a great way to to do that, to, to, uh, kind of create the system. Uh, so yeah, you don't have to assign different roles and stuff beforehand and things like that. So I, I think it's really, uh, it's really interesting. But, um, now kind of moving on from there, Traveler has developed a quite expansive and thorough lore all around it. And I wanted to ask, um, why why did you make the choice to include like noble ranks and things like that or noble titles i should say um a good question that's a good question um we you know role playing works when just as um i'll start over here just as five ensigns on the enterprise don't get to have much in the way of choices of what they do. They are given orders. They live, they live and work in a social, in a military hierarchy. And there are people in charge of them who tell them what to do. And that's what they do. And rarely does that situation have any freedom of action. Um, The same thing in the military, uh, the same thing in a corporate environment. And that's not a lot of fun for role playing. Uh, we wanted an environment where people were free to make their own choices. And uh, it works well if we decide that the territory we're going to play in is a year away from the capital of the empire. And uh, we have communication at the speed of light. And so it could, people are have to fall on their own resources and make their own decisions. And then we've ranked those people in terms of social hierarchy. So those some are naturally have greater power or or respect from others. Um, But beyond the role playing, the social environment we envisioned was not elected representatives, but a hereditary nobility who ran things. And we're in charge of making things. They just weren't there to take what they wanted. They were there because of their own social responsibility. Um, They are responsible for ruling. Somebody chose them to be that. The circumstances of birth chose them to be in charge. But we got away from all kinds of how do you choose the leaders? How do you have elections? How do they happen? Who manages them? It's just a natural structure out there. That's why we had nobility. Okay. It's a space empire. Of course you have nobles. 
<laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Of course, um, you have swords too, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and that is always one of those uh things with like uh space empires. Um uh we always kind of go back to swords, don't we? We always want to bring swords into it for some reason. But uh you know, uh, there's there's a quote by Heinlein, which I cannot repeat from memory, but he basically says a sword is what you need for close in. A gun is just absolutely offensive. It's not defensive. You can't make somebody stop with a gun unless you shoot him. A sword, you can poke him. You can swing it. You can do all kinds of inhibiting moves. A sword makes people respond and kind of back off the way a gun never does. Um, I'll have to look that up because he really said it much better than I can. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's well, spaceships great. are especially vulnerable to swords. <laughs> spacesuits, <laughs> spacesuits, yeah, spacesuits are especially vulnerable to swords. No, absolutely. Um, but and no, and that's a that's a great insight from Heinlein because I think that is, uh, it it is interesting to think. Um, I don't know, and there's just something about. Um, I don't know, there's just something. Um, about an empire or a space empire that kind of um uh and some of the fiction i guess that you are reading it's just kind of lives in our imaginations and stuff so uh um and i think it's a uh, you know it's definitely an interesting choice to to kind of set up a you know the space aristocracy kind of thing in this this empire um so uh um and it also does, like you were saying, it sets up a lot of the different social interactions, right? It sets up if somebody has a certain title, if they're a duke or if they're, you know, something else, it really sets up um, those social interactions. So people playing around the table just kind of can know already, oh, man, you know, I'm a this and this person's a duke. So I I have to act a certain way around that character or something. And I think that's interesting. Well, well you know, um, when we play Dungeons and Dragons, we are influenced. Basically, Dungeons and Dragons is Lord of the Rings in role playing. Yeah. He, he, we know it, that's what it is. He, yeah. But you know, when people play, nobody wants to play an entire multi week campaign and only throw fireball once. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's yeah. that's the Lord of the Rings. And so we are influenced by what our players want. And in Dungeons and Dragons, they want to be able to fire, throw fireball all the time mm -hmm. um, or some other magic spell all the time. And so naturally the game evolves and, and transforms into allowing the players to do what they want to do. And they still have to make good choices, but that's what they want to do. Um, Traveler does the same thing. It, it, and and I, I sometimes say that I imagine that, you know, I justify the, the multi-technical levels and uh, the, the the various economic situations that they encounter on world after world, that you know the the empire of the future is not going to be homogenous. It's not going to be the same everywhere. Even in America, we only build jet engines in two cities across the country. Um, you go to just outside of my community here. And they can't build anything. It's just a little town, sleepy town, and everything's brought in. Um, you look at the variations of economic prosperity or social interaction or cultural value. I mean, they're little towns, and they just have nothing except people live in them. Um, and then you have big cities that have huge museums and they have factories. But this city builds one thing, and that city builds another. Um, and I've always patterned what I'm trying to show people by pointing them to America or to the world, that it's not homogenous. Even though America, world, Earth has a tech level of nine, perhaps, it varies from two or one in uh, some unexplored portions of South America to very, very high and in the uh, industrial cities of Europe or or. California. So there's there's always and and when players or referees look at that, they can find inspiration with that. And they're trying to say, how come this has a low tech level? How come this has a high tech level? How come this area is poor and this area is rich? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, I and and I think the tech levels and all of all of that stuff is is very interesting and in h- how you developed a system for that. Um I'm wondering too um uh you know, uh a lot of the game like you you chose to like codify a lot of things. Like if you write out a string of almost like code, that'll tell you if you know what those things mean, it'll tell you like a character if they they have certain numbers or letters that'll tell you you can just kind of like do a shorthand like a code. And I'm just wondering kind of what influenced your choice to do that. You can do the same with like a star system or a planet. Like you can just write out like a series of letters and numbers and you could just say that to your player and they'll know what kind of, you know, system or something they're dealing with. Well, I'm glad you noticed. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a, a traveler is a, about making a lot of data available easily to everyone. And, mm-hmm. and some people resist it and they don't like doing it. And so they don't have to, I, I understand, but you know, it, it's, it's mathematical place theory. If, if we make the, the string of digits about a person telling them who they are, strength, dexterity, endurance, intelligence, education, social standing. And we make them all single digits by making them hexadecimal. So the A is 10 and B is 11. Then we can have a six digit string and you can have them in a column and you can have 10 characters and you write them all in, in, uh, in a column and just scan down and you can see which one has the strongest social standing or which one has the best strength or whatever it is that you want to know, um, as opposed to writing numbers out of three dash, seven dash, 12 dash, whatever. And it just doesn't write down very easily. Mm -hmm. Um, Players who actually use what is there and the systems that are presented in the game find that they absorb the information and it makes the game go quicker. They enjoy it more. They have a better time. Um, but I always say, if, if you don't like that system or you don't want to play with that system, you certainly can use it as you want to. Of course, that's how role playing gets anyway. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Why fight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so, yeah. so one of the first reviews that came out for Traveler was in a... Um, a fanzine, you know, and and the reviewer criticized it because we didn't have adventures or enough mm-hmm. adventures. They wanted adventures. Okay. And he criticized that. And the editor, um, in an editorial insertion right in the review, said, and I won't play one that gives me adventures. I want to make my own. Mm-hmm. Well, you can make your own whether I give you adventures or not. <laughs> yeah. But but there are two kinds of players, the ones who want some guidance on what adventures there are mm-hmm. and the ones who want to build their own universe. Mm-hmm. And uh, Beverly addresses both of those. Yeah, absolutely. Provides materials for both of those. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like I was mentioning a little earlier, the lore has kind of taken on a life of its own, right? And um, there is the third Imperium and... Uh, you have emperors and genealogies and all of these things that have developed. Uh, maybe just uh, um, is that did that just start developing as you were creating more materials or you were just letting your imagination kind of run and getting out your space empire fantasies? <laughs> you know, so I was talking to somebody the other day about the Doomerest series. It's a space opera series by Irish writer E.C. Tubb. 32 books about the quest of Dumeris in a uh, galaxy of the far future, human dominated, and he's trying to find his lost homeworld Earth that nobody seems to know where it is. And it's a a dystopic universe. But I noticed even though it's there's no central government, there's no each world is independent, they they interacted with interstellar trade because basically the worlds aren't strong enough to support themselves. And so trade, there is trade that goes on. And uh, even as dystopic as it was, he was buying some sort of drugs from, from a pharmacy. And, you know, he was illegally, it was, he didn't have a prescription, but what, and so he was paying under the table for them, but it does say, 
there are drugs. There is some sort of central authority somewhere that dictates what they are and controls their distribution. Um, and th there's more order to the universe than you'd think mm -hmm. because that's in there. Well, we tried to do the same thing. We're doing um, once we had a Navy, once we said there was a Navy, we had to figure out who owns that Navy. Is it an empire? Is it a, are there two empires? Um, probably at least two because they're, you don't need a Navy if there's only one empire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so a lot of it just naturally follows. If you have a Navy, then you have to have an army. Okay. Why are they fighting? What are they doing? And we kept building reasons into that great lore mm -hmm. of why people are in conflict and people are always in conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, of course, the essence of adventure anyway. You know, um, even Star Trek has to have enemies, has ships that are armed. They, Star Trek is supposed to be out of about a very peaceful federation, but they put guns on their ships. So mm -hmm. they must have some idea how that works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. No. And that's, uh, and it's just it's just fascinating to see how that's grown over the years. And I'm wondering before we, you know, we're talking about the past quite a bit before we move into the the future and what you're working on now. And and in that, I just want to kind of ask, I know, uh, you know, obviously, a lot of people who listen to the show are running games, um, you know, they're game masters um, over the years. Uh, what have you have you picked up any tips or anything you like to share to the referees or the game masters who are running traveler, like uh, any, uh, any thoughts on, you know, how they can run some really good campaigns and sessions? Boy, you know, you would think I would just have a load of tips. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I, I get notes from people all the time and I've taken to, to harvesting them and preserving them because I, I get something from somebody, you know, every so often that they hated math or they they couldn't re they didn't read or mm -hmm. whatever it was wrong, whatever their challenge was in grade school or high school. And they discovered Traveler. And all of a sudden they understood how vectors worked or they understood place theory. There's a lot of math in Traveler. <laughs> and I get a lot of testimonials about how Traveler moved them to understand how to do math. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the the reading rate on on Traveler is, you know, second year college. And yet like, somebody who wants to read it will read it and they get something out of it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not so much me telling you tips on how to play because people have their own things and they make them work wonderfully. It's you know, I would love to say that all these people who send me testimonials that they weren't good in grade school, they played Traveler, and now they're an astrophysicist. <laughs> and I'm glad that I'm the one who made them an astrophysicist. Well, I'm not the one who made them. They had it there in them, and we provided them some spark or some inspiration, perhaps. But they had it in them. Um and Traveler depends on that, not just for career advancement, but for just people having a good time. That it's this this interesting, enjoyable group of people who get together as friends, and somebody takes the responsibility of saying, I'm gonna run this, and everybody else takes the responsibility of coming to their house and eating their chips and drinking their Coke and playing <laughs> around the table. Uh, and they all have a good time. And you know, that by itself seems to be a worthy enterprise. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I say this from time to time, that this has just got, got to be the best hobby in the world. Mm -hmm. It's good, clean fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's enjoyable. It's reading. It's all these valuable things that any parent should tell a kid they should do, mm -hmm. um, that any adult should be glad that they're, significant other is in this instead of a number of other things that spend a lot of money and uh, are not especially healthy or wholesome or anything else. Yeah. Um, 
when we started, you know, and I, I remember we were prohibited from playing when the sun was up <laughs> because we weren't getting any work done. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we were just in it for fun. Mm -hmm. And here we are, you know, 45, 50 years later, and parents are playing these games with their children. Grandparents are playing with the grandchildren. There's no better way of communicating with the next generation than across a gaming table. They will do things that they will share things that they'll never share at the dinner table or just sitting watching a movie. Yeah. That these discussions happen because people are role playing. So, so I'm going to go off on a tangent here. Yeah. You know, when back then, when we were doing that, when role playing started, and not just traveler, but when role playing started. Mm -hmm. There were there was a, a magazine called Seventeen for girls. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I had an epiphany at one point when I realized that it was not marketed to seventeen year olds. It was marketed to fourteen year olds mm -hmm. wanted to be seventeen. Yeah, and it told them how much eyeshadow they should do without looking terrible, or what the current heartthrob was that they could have a crush on, and that sort of thing. And on the other hand. For boys, you either had organized sports, which leaves a lot of kids out, yeah. or organized Boy Scouting with Boys Life magazine, which also leaves a lot of kids out. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean this not at all negative to the people who play role-playing games, but a lot of them are, what, nerds? <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. You know, not the sports, not the Boy Scout outdoors kids. It's the ones who want to sit at home at a desk and look at things or write things and make lists and whatever they do. And mm -hmm. and they enjoy that. And role playing came in and all of a sudden gave them something to do. Mm -hmm. But it's more than gave them something to do. It trained them for the future. Um, you know, Heinlein again has has a, another set of phrases he talks about you know any capable man should be able to uh, plan an invasion build a fire explore <laughs> something he lists all the things that you do in role playing yeah um and and we're for the for the the kids who start playing role playing and i'm talking you know adults we have a lot of role adult role players but Somewhere kids encounter role playing and they learn how to budget and how money works. Mm -hmm. They learn how to plan to remember to bring the toilet paper with them on their camping trip. You know, all these things that because a, a good referee will say, did you bring the toilet paper? <laughs> no. OK, <laughs> well, then you're uncomfortable. Um, mm -hmm. And and kids are learning a lot more about just just as. 14-year-old girls are learning how to be 17-year-old girls by reading in all the articles in 17 magazine. 14-year-old boys are learning how to be 17-year-old boys, capable, confident, uh, successful young men on the things that we don't get a lot of training on how to do. Mm -hmm. What to bring with you, what to plan ahead for, what to do. You know, um, I'm involved in, a, in an organization that gives music scholarships to grade school and high school kids. And we know, and part of the, the marketing that we do for that is we know that music lessons teach kids how to study and how to apply themselves and how to self-analyze um, their activity and then correct self-correct. Uh, music lessons are a great process for that. That don't, doesn't work for everybody. Role-playing games are another version of that thing. When you apply yourself, when you're participating in this, you'll learn a lot of things about life, not just gaming, yeah. but life. And uh, we come back to my thing that this has got to be the best hobby in the world because how can you not want your kids in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can you, how can you criticize it? I mean, anything could be misused, and I've seen it misused. 
Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, it's a wholesome enterprise that it's pretty hard to tell people they shouldn't be in. Yeah. It's no, not for I, everybody. Yeah. But the ones who are in it get a lot out of it. Oh, yeah. No, I, I I couldn't agree more. I, I I mean, I had a similar experience growing up. You know, I grew up in the 80s and it was um, there. There was some cultural backlash at the time. And I just remember, I think it was my mom one time, you know, hearing something about, you know, role playing games or something probably about Dungeons and Dragons. And and she was just kind of like, you know, what do you do again? And, you know, and I explained it to her, you know, and um, <laughs> but like she's like. You know, I just kind of remember it like, you know, she's looking and it was like me and a couple of my friends were in my bedroom. We were reading about history because we wanted to understand the fantasy worlds or the science fiction world. So we were reading either history or something about science fiction. We were um, we were doing math problems. Right. We're of our own choice. Right. Because we're we got to figure out the you know, we got to figure out our AC and Dungeons and Dragons. We got to figure out all this stuff. Uh, so we're doing Neg- negative numbers, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> don't get that till high school. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so and so she's like, you know, my mom was just like, well, I don't see why that's a problem, right? The the members of the football team are getting drunk and doing drugs and getting arrested. And you're in your room with your friends that I know, whose parents I know, doing math problems and reading, right? Like it was, you know, it was just like, so she was just like, that sounds fine to me, you know, or whatever. Um, uh, but no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, um, uh, and now even as the hobby has expanded, uh, and, 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 and grown, uh, to include a lot more people, uh, I, I think you just see that people are, um, understanding that there is a lot of value here, not only imaginative entertainment value, but, uh, there is other value. And I'm, I'm obviously, you know, beginning to play with my kids as well. And, um, you know, I, you know, you can just see, you know, you know, maybe they don't want to read too much. But if I say, hey, here's this book about this game that I play, they get interested in it, right? You know, they get interested in it. Um, say, oh, you don't want to do your math worksheet, but here um, you can figure out what your character can do, you know, how they, you know, what they're, you know, something about your character. Well, they're going to do that math problem, right? They're going to do that math problem. You know, um, fascinating. I love telling this story. I was playing with my grandson. He was eight. And I don't know how it happened, but he ended up with like a billion credits. Uh, (laughs) And he had, so I'm talking to him and he's got a billion credits there. And I said, okay, you have lunch. It costs you 22 credits. And so then he subtracted 22 from a billion and just brought all the nines down. Oh, and man. now he has 999 billion, you know. And, and he, he knew the rules and he applied them. Where else would he ever actually manipulate yeah. numbers like that yeah. confidently yeah. and happily? Mm-hmm. And it just it, it struck me that this is, you know, we're, it's a secret project to educate kids that without letting them know. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. It's like, yeah, um, absolutely. It's just like, oh, all of that reading you did about history and all of those math problems, I was just educating you. But I, I put it in a game, and so you thought oh, you were I having fun. You. I hate you for doing that to me. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, wait, we were having fun doing it. <laughs> but anyway, um I wanted to get back to because uh, now there is, uh, you know, kind of coming up to the present day, there's Traveler 5. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Traveler 5 if somebody's not familiar with that? Well, Traveler 5 is my personal quest to make all of this stuff that we did for Traveler over all these years, put it in one place. And I'm not sure that that's the right thing I should have been doing, but I did, you know. Mm. We, we, we published... Um, the original Traveler kind of on the installment plan. We did three little books and then we did another book and another book and an adventure. And I wanted to put them all together and, and, and revise them and make them manipulatable and interacting as much as I could. And so that's what we have is Traveler five, um, three huge, like 300 page hardcovers in a slipcase. If anything you want to know about Traveler, if you know where to look, it's in those books. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. And 
it really is in those books. I mean, you can build all the worlds you want. You can build all the spaceships you want. It's well thought out. It's it's all there. It it's got uh, everything I could think of. You know, not everything that you we could possibly do, but everything that is in the basic original game from 1977 is expanded on completely. Mm-hmm. You know, I finished that. I, I it was a big project, and I worked and worked and worked. And when it was done, my plate was empty, and my head was full of all of these mm-hmm. ideas. Mm-hmm. And one of the ideas that was in Traveler 5 is the idea that you can harvest someone's mind and put it into a clone to make him live forever, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever. And uh, I that just stuck with me. I had the idea that that was a great concept. Mm-hmm. And so in that free time, I decided I'd write the Traveler novel, <laughs> Asia to the Imperium. And it was because I had that free time at the end, and I had my head filled with all of this Traveler lore. And it just kind of poured out from me. What an experience, you know? Yeah. I have to say that I was afraid to write a Traveler novel for the longest time. I didn't think it had, I had it in me. I didn't know what story to tell. There's a lot of um, prejudice against role-playing adventures as novels. Mm -hmm. In fact, my publisher said, you know, I've read role-playing adventures as novels, and they don't work. (laughs) (laughs) But this isn't that, she said, which I was pleased for her to say to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And so that was a big jump then to write The Agent of the Imperium, right? Um, You said you had some free time, but you had all these ideas. Um, Could you, because obviously uh, myself, I'm a writer, uh, a lot of people who listen are writing. Could you walk us through the process like a little bit? Uh, Did you just have like a ton of notes or a ton of ideas? Or how did you then kind of take it away from just a a role-playing game adventure and, and bring it into kind of a full novel? Well, I'll say it this way, that, you know, role-playing and role-playing writing describes the universe in one way. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it, fiction allows us to see it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my head, is was filled, is still filled with what I think the Empire is like, what the universe is like in the far future. And And there are ways when you write a novel, you're able to show different aspects of that universe than if you're writing role-playing stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I took that opportunity. I wanted to show what the empire was like. And, and I, the, the device of, of this agent of the Imperium who has stuff, has a chip put in, put in somebody's head and he can, and the new mind takes him over and then, he could do the agent, the Imperium's work, and then that mind evaporates, and the old person comes back into his body and goes on. Um, gave me the ability to travel across several centuries with the same viewpoint, seeing what's going on. I've, I've, I've explained that concept imperfectly. I think you have to read this story to really understand what's going on. Mm-hmm. But, um, we are seeing what we get to see what the empire looks like through the eyes of a traveler mm-hmm. who's exploring large portions of it. Mm-hmm. And along the way, we get to see all this background of what the story of about how the empire is and why we hate the Jodani and, and uh, who some of the aliens are and, and how they work and um, some of the great high points of history that shaped what the empire is when you finally get to the golden age that we're all used to from traveling. Mm -hmm. No. And uh, I think that concept is, is really fascinating, um, especially because you can then uh, span multiple times and, um, and different ages and, but still have the reader be able to follow a character that they become, you know, they become to know. Um, And, and no, I think that's a really interesting concept. And I think you're definitely right. You know, there's total, it's, it's almost totally different from when you're writing a role-playing game, describing things 
describing things but then when you slip into the novel right you slip into that character right things are more personal there there's more drama tied around uh you know that individual to get the people you know readers to care about them and kind of go along on the journey so uh uh that's uh that's interesting um and uh that you that you kind of decided to go to go that route i mean that's and um but I mean, I think it's just, uh, especially with a game like Traveler with so much lore and backstory, it's a, to me, it's a wonder there aren't many more Traveler novels, actually. <laughs> uh, it, it's a wonder, too, that there aren't many more myself. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I have a unique perspective, perspective on the Empire and on the universe mm-hmm. of Traveler. Mm-hmm. And so it falls on me to do that basic writing then busy writing the next installment just so that people can see more of how this all works. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, um, and as we're coming up here on the end of our time, I did definitely want to ask, what does the future hold for Traveler and for, uh, I guess, the novels as well and for you? Um, As I say, I'm working on the novel. I'm working on um, a variety of projects. I, I, my next big project, I think, I want to make a player's version of Traveler 5, mm-hmm. something that somebody, that a, a book, a, a reference that ought to sit at every player's hand mm-hmm. and they're playing at the table because it will be filled with the stuff they need to know, um, accessible, mm-hmm. easy to use, focused on them answering their own questions as they come up because rather than just say to the referee i want to do this if they have access to the rules as well they can manipulate them to their advantage and it's always a good thing yeah yeah absolutely and of course you know i enjoy a leisurely life as well so (laughs) (laughs) i'm not working 24 hours a day sure I am planning on going to a couple of conventions. I'm going to TravelerCon in Pennsylvania in the middle of October, and then uh, Madison's uh, Gamehole Con the week after that in uh, Wisconsin. Where can people find Traveler and the novel? Uh, I suggest you go to www.farfuture.net. Um, it's a great starting point. It basically going to sell you Traveler in some form either as a book or a CD-ROM filled with files. Um, It's a great starting point, and it has links to send you off to a bunch of other places, to discussion boards and other editions that are from people, all kinds of things. Um, It's a rudimentary site, but it's a great starting point. Okay. And I will be sure to put a link to farfuture.net um, as well as some other uh, links that I can find in the show notes for this episode at dicegeeks.com. So anybody who is listening right now can just head over there, find the show notes for this episode, and you'll be able to find those links. So you can find Traveler, you can find uh, Agent of the Imperial, the novel as well. And uh, I am sure many, many other things. Uh, well, Mark, uh, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show today. Um, I probably have a million more questions, but I definitely want to respect your time. Um, So thank you so much for being on the show today. I want to thank you for having me. I enjoy talking about Traveler. I I come back to this thing that I said that this, not just Traveler, but this has got to be the best hobby in the world to be in. All right, there you have it, guys. Oh, my goodness. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Mark Miller as much as I did because I had a blast. If you want to learn more about Traveler, if you want to learn more about his novel, please head over to DiceGeeks.com. The show notes for this episode have links to his site, farfuture.net, where you can find Traveler in many, many different forms. Also, I've thrown in a few extra links as well so you can learn more about Mark and his work. Please head over there. Check those out. All right. Now, guys, if you want some free stuff, check out DiceGeeks.com slash free. If you want to support the show, you can do so on Patreon.com slash DiceGeeks. If you want to have some awesome resources for your games... 
You can check out DiceGeeks.com, Amazon.com, or DriveThroughRPG.com and just search for the Books of Random Tables. Those are resources that I create. And of course, I have science fiction and all other genres as well. Those are resources that help you play better games. I want to thank you so much for listening. And until next Wednesday, keep gaming!